You want to make sure the breath is your own. Because there are lots of different committee members in the mind who want to use the breath, too. And they have their agendas and they have their desires. And their desires that you've identified with in the past, so it's very easy for you to identify with them again. But sometimes they'll tell you to do something you know isn't right, in which case you have to be able to say no to them. And they're going to use not only reasoning, but they're going to use force. And one of the ways they force you is to get into your breath. So you start breathing in ways that irritate the body, irritate the mind. And then the threat is, if you don't give in to me, it's, this irritation is not going to end. We have to see through that claim. You, you can reclaim the breath. You can make it yours. So you breathe in a way that's calming, in a way that's soothing. And even though some of the old hormones may still be in the body, so the effect last, their effect lasts for a while. You don't have to take that as a sign that you're still angry or still greedy or still whatever. Just stick with it for a bit, and as you reclaim the breath, then changes the balance of power inside. So it's good to be with the breath as much as you can. Make sure that it's comfortable coming in, comfortable going out. So you can detect little things as they come up, little attempts to for something else to come and reclaim the breath. Because if you don't occupy your body, if you don't occupy your breath, something else will. So don't let that something else come in. Or if it has come in, learn how to push it out. You take claim of the breath again. The more familiar you are with, familiar you are with the breath, the more you'll be able to catch these things quickly and deal with them effectively. This is one of the reasons why we work with the breath again and again and again. Because it's a tool that you'll be able to use at all times. Because it's not something you do just as you meditate, when you're breathing all the time. And those voices of greed, aversion, delusion, lust, fear, whatever, they can grab the breath at any time. So you have to be prepared. And make use of this. All too often people meditate and they say, well, I don't see any change in my life. Well, you have to carry the skills of the meditation into your life, and then you're going to see a change. At the same time, you want to make sure you've got the right context in terms of the way you exercise restraint over your senses, the way you observe the precepts. Because those two practices create a good container for the meditation so that you're with the breath as much as you can, as much as you can be, and not distracted by other things, and not doing things that you're going to later regret. So to carry the meditation into your life, you can't just squeeze it into the cracks that are already there. You've got to rearrange some of the, the bricks, some of the foundation pieces. So it really does become a good foundation for the practice. You might think instead of bringing the meditation into your life, bring your life into the meditation. Make the meditation the context. Make that your first priority, and let the other priorities fall in line behind that. As John Lee says, you put the zero first. In other words, you're not going to be adding anything onto the trouble in life. And no matter how many zeros you have, it doesn't really count. If you start putting the zeros afterwards, then whatever issues you have, they take over and they turn into millions and trillions. So make the mind one right here and then turn it into zero, as he said. Put that first.